Good morning all and welcome to this Atempo CAE Technology Services webinar. My name is Nick Crisp. I work uh, at Atempo in Paris and I'm delighted to be with uh, two people who are going to walk us through this session today on migrating, consolidating, end of support uh, Dell EMC storages. So first of all, a big hello to Mark Smith, Chief Technologist at CAE. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Nick. How are you? Very well, yeah. Nice to have you uh, on board. And we should also have Christophe Daras, based in London. Christophe is uh, head of Northern Europe for Atempo. Morning, Christophe. Yeah, can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. Yes, thanks very much. So just before I hand over to Mark, who will take us through some of CAE's technological solutions, and uh, he will hand over then to Christophe. Uh, just to remind you that this session will last around about 30 minutes. If you do have any questions, uh, please do feel free to use the, the chat or the question tab that you should have in the uh, live storm window. And uh, we'll try and handle those questions at the end if we have time. If not, we'll get back to you, obviously, uh, with some answers. So just very, very quickly, a few words on a tempo. Some of you may know a tempo as a, a backup company. We also have solutions for managing very large uh, data sets, including uh, migrating between different storages, including the uh, Dell EMC uh, storage equipment. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark. So my name is Mark Smith and I'm Chief Technologist at CAE. And I guess my role is the person who's tasked with you know, looking at the data center, looking at our technologies, looking at our solutions. Uh, and, and I guess for those of you on the call that don't know CAE, um, you know, we're a UK based technology company. We're a uh, I guess the old school way of putting it would be a value added reseller integrator. Um, but we are solutions focused. Um, although we are a Dell Titanium partner, I'm really proud to be a Dell Titanium partner. We are vendor agnostic and technology, uh, I guess, focused um, technology that delivers an outcome to your business. Um, we do everything you'd expect a, a good technology partner to do. So everything from planning right through the, to the design and anything from managing the whole estate, managed services and the support and the triage of those technologies. And, and we know that there are a bunch of Dell stroke EMC storage systems that are end of life, end of support or approaching it. And it just seemed a good opportunity to talk to, um, I guess, the user base to say there are easy ways to move um, the data between the two. And as you're starting that planning process to retire or replace your, your legacy equipment, um, then let us be part of that um, solution for you. So if we move on to the next slide, you know, when, it, when we talk about file migration, data migration, it's really easy to think that it's not a big task, but I guess the size of the problem does depend on the size of the data. And we all know there are several approaches to doing data migration. You can do it yourself with low cost or free tools, such as Robocopy or manually copy the data if you want to, or even use the manufacturer supplied tools. And some of those tools are really good in certain cases, but we should always take a step back and think about the data. You know, the data is the thing that our businesses have strived to create or strive to use. It's what affects and influences our business decisions. And it's really, really important. As you bring a new story system in, you need to move the data, but you can't afford the downtime usually associated with, with stop dead copying from one system to another. So you need to find a better way. Um, you might have a limited migration window as well. Say um, you need to migrate, you need to balance the migration traffic with your production workload. And so how do you schedule that, that uh, migration workload if you're just using standard tools? And you've also got to think about the permissions and the access control lists and, and the things that make that data secure. So can you be really sure that your manual or your robocopy type replication and migration has preserved all of that data? And I guess, how do you prove that the data, every single file, every single bit of data has been migrated and is identical to the source? You know, it's fine if you've got five terabytes of data to move, but what if you've got 100 million files to move? Uh, how do you prove that back to the business that you did the right thing and that everything is there and all of those really important business assets, whether they be your financial data or whether it be your customer's data or whether they be you know, assets that you need to preserve as part of a collection you know, for a long period of time? How do you prove that? It all takes time, 
it all takes time that your project team probably do not have. So I think that's where Miria from a tempo and the tempo migration package really comes in. And at that point, I'd like to hand over to Christoph and he's going to go through the key features and benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hello again, everybody. So I think that, yeah, starting the, the key features and benefits side, I think that I would like to start by the end saying that uh, this offer that we are trying to provide today between uh, Atempo and CAE is really a turnkey solution. So the idea is to, to bring together the competencies and the experience of CAE um, with their customer uh, as integrator to manage the project, to, to do some consulting for their customer. And uh, on our side, as a software developer, to, you know, to have a, a software that enables CAE to really uh, manage a smooth migration for you. So this software has been developed really at the, uh, for the HPC environment at the beginning. So Miria uses a parallel processing and a multitask environment, and it has been really optimized for multi-threading. And uh, I think that uh, the, the, the result of that is that we have a really highly scalable solution and really fast solution. Um, just to give you some ideas or some numbers to, to keep in mind, I think that, uh, for instance, in London, we did a migration uh, of three petabytes in one month. So that means that we were moving something like 100 terabytes a day. And uh, recently in Germany, I think that uh, it's a really recent news from last week, I think that we did a two petabyte in one week on a really, really big data center. And uh, it was a, a kind of a parallel FIME system and uh, with a, a huge infinite network in the middle. And we were able to manage half a petabyte a day. So that really when we are talking about a really massive um, um, a file migration, and of course, uh, I think that uh, who can the, the the most can also lower, and then we can also, and we are uh, usually also uh, making a lot of migration around hundred terabyte, half a petabyte, and uh, I think that this is what uh, our bread and butter today. The second thing is the uh, automatic and incremental uh, migration workflow. I think that uh, there is various option there. I think that uh, yeah, that you can leverage, for instance. You can, uh, at this stage, run tasks at share level. So you can try to manage really at a share level to have a lot of granularity. And you can uh, manage your migration at this level. That's really interesting. And you can also, at this stage, also include, exclude file, for instance. If you, if you want to uh, manage some uh, file during your migration, exclude some file, you can do it also at this stage. So that's also really interesting features. Then FastCan is just really one of the sweet spots of our solution. This is our ability to, to create snapshot and calculate snap differential. And uh, that allows us to detect and move a newly created file really quickly and uh, without rescanning everything or working the file tree. And that's, uh, that's really a huge benefit, especially when you want to um, uh, minimize the cutover at the downtime. And then source storage array is still alive, so low impact on production. So again, I think that we have also a value option there. And we can even, for instance, schedule some incremental, um, asking them to, to take place or to run during the night, for instance, to, to, to really have a, a lowest impact possible on the production while we are migrating. Uh, of course, we do all that with uh, automatic data integrity checks. So we do some uh, data integrity check at block level. And uh, yeah, that's really the, in, in few bullet points, the, the main interest of our solution. Regarding the MIA for migration, the software component, I think that uh, you can see in the uh, quick chart here, I think that we have to, uh, really two parts. The Miria server, uh, who hold, really holds the database and manage the overall solution and delegate the job to the Miria agent. It could be a physical machine or a virtual machine. And uh, then you have the Miria agent, or what we call also data mover. We call it data mover because it's just in charge of moving data between the source to the target. So um, the sizing of those data mover will really depend on the, of the project side. I think that the, uh, the CPU, the memory, and the network uh, will determine what, uh, what size of data mover we will need for that. And, uh, what is interesting as well is that, yeah, we, as we keep all the ACL natively, uh, we will use one data mover for CIFS or SMB type of file and one for the NFS type of file. And then we have the, to manage all that, the Miria web interface. And this web interface, yeah, uh, I think that I will go a little bit in detail on that, but uh, the idea is really yeah, 
the, the way we uh, um, it works to configure the project, but also to supervise what is happening and to see some statistics. So if I go a little bit in detail here, I think that uh, we have yeah, uh, two parts in this chart. You can see a little bit better. So at the beginning, what we do is that uh, we, we set up the infrastructure, then uh, we go to the um, a little bit more on setting and then on the migration. So here we are in the migration interface and you see on the top of the slide, on the top right, you have two ways to see it. One is um, uh, to see it by volume and the other one by object. I think that both are interesting actually and most of the time I think that the object is, is, is preferred for the uh, to the um, to 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 have a, to find a, to to tune for, to tune your solution. Um, you can see on the graph uh, on on the left, yeah, the the the, the migrated volume and then the average speed. Here it's uh, uh, in, in megabytes, but uh, yeah, you can have also an object as I said. And then you have this um, um, this drawing there when you see uh, the cumulated volume on the run by run. I think here, for the sake of this example, we just have one run, but normally we have various runs that we do a first synchronization and then incremental synchronization. And normally, it will really, uh, the volume will step down after a few, uh, uh, run by run to, to, to decrease the number of uh, files that you will migrate from uh, one run to the other one, from one sync to the other one. So, Christoph, so it seems like a little bit like you do a full backup or you try to do a full synchronization maybe with with some scheduling to uh, limit the bandwidth implications or bandwidth hit i guess between production and um, the migration target and then after that you can do incremental migrations to keep everything up to date ready for the cutover yeah that's that's, uh, that, that's the process actually we do first full synchronization between the source and the target and uh, we try to do it within shadow mode to make sure that uh, operation is not impacted by this uh, um, by this first synchronization. And then during the time we have done the first synchronization, of course, some uh, some file have been uh, created, deleted or modified. And then what we do, we do incremental synchronization to uh, to update those files uh, to to the target uh, storage. And so we do that few times until the point where we can uh, uh, agree with the customer that we are ready for, for the cutover and uh, we can predict uh, with a good uh, um, level of probability the downtime it will take to, 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 to manage the final cutover. So, and when we do the cutover, what we do is that we, we really uh, work with the customer to uh, put the source storage normally on a read-only mode and then uh, let the, the, the user know, uh, run the stop all the tasks on Miria, run the last synchronization, and then uh, change the routing table and connect the, new, the user to the new, uh, to the new storage. On the, on, the, on the second side of this uh, drive, here on this, uh, pro, uh, this slide, you see the project. So you can, we, we, we create a project and below the project, we can create various tasks. The idea on, uh, on the benefit of that is we need also to give some flexibility in the way we manage it, which means that we can, uh, for instance, create tasks by, uh, by shares. So then what you can do is that you can, uh, yeah, I don't know, you have uh, 20 or 30 shares to move. You can uh, uh, have a, a view by shares of your uh, migration, and you can then decide to make a cutover by shares as well, which is also uh, really handy. Uh, and a lot of customers are choosing that option, actually. So, so Christoph, if you could do it share by share, could you take some, could you have two source storage systems that you want to consolidate into one? Completely. Yeah, you can do that. And I've actually, I think that uh, I have one example later I will expand on uh, where we have a customer choosing to restructure his data as well in the same time that migrating. So I think that happened regularly. I think that uh, when you do a migration, you buy a new storage, I think that you, uh, yeah, sometimes you uh, you do that because you want to consolidate a lot of small servers to a bigger one, or uh, you want to, uh, or you decide to restructure a little bit your data because you have internal restructuring and you want to uh, to reattribute shares differently. So this is the right time to to do this kind of operation. So that's why also I think that it's interesting. I think that. Uh, uh, to have uh, your consulting team working on this kind of uh, uh, migration and preparation of the migration, actually. 
So as I said before, the, the migration is really on the, the three parts. The, the, the key part, of course, as usual, I think that this is the preparation and the planning. So this is the right time to ask you a lot of questions to yourself uh, and to engage with the CA consulting team, time to think about restructuring your data as well. This is really where it's important to figure out uh, what you want to get at the end in the, and uh, how you want to, to manage your cutover phase as well. And uh, there is a, yeah, a lot of things that you have to, to prepare as well to make sure that uh, uh, you will get a successful migration. Then we will do a first synchronization of all the files from the source to the destination and then incremental until the cutover. Let's go now to the example. I think that we have two examples that I would like to highlight here. I think the idea of this uh, webinar was really to share experience regarding migration. And uh, so we have two examples I would like to highlight there. One, you know, first use case, small, um, uh, small component of 100 terabytes, but uh, a bit of file, 100 million files start to be a lot and uh, for compared to the volume. Uh, the, the overall throughput was not so good. I think that five terabytes a day is uh, really, really slow. Uh, there was some, I think that uh, uh, we had to pay attention a lot to the network. We had to, it was, I think that uh, uh, a bit complex, uh, one of the uh, complex uh, migration to manage. Uh, there was not a lot of shares actually. There was, I don't know, something like uh, 20 or 30 shares to, to move, so not, not too big. The customer took advantage of this migration also to exclude some files. Uh, the idea was to, to clean a little bit uh, the, the, the source storage and uh, not move everything to the new NAS. We use, of course, uh, for this migration, the multi-trading. We move the file while scanning and we control the bandwidth to make sure that uh, it was working well and during the migration, that uh, there was no impact or minimum impact on, uh, on the user. Uh, preserving the ACL and, uh, um, and performing a data integrity check. So that's really one example uh, that we did recently in a, in a university hospital. And I guess the second one, and uh, yeah, sorry, on the, on the previous one, I think that what was as well interesting is that we have here uh, the data mover on the Miria server. Miria server by default can also act as a data mover. And as I said formerly, I think that we use uh, one uh, data mover for CIFS type of file and one for NFS. So in that case, we put um, uh, the server on Linux and the data mover on Windows um, to, to, to move the file and preserve the ACL. Next example is a little bit a bigger, uh, a bigger migration, 400 terabytes, but not, uh, I think, that 180 million files. There was two components. So this is the case that you were mentioning, Mark, two two storages uh, going to one big NAS. And uh, so we deploy as well two data mover, but all the, the, all the files were uh, CIFS. So we did everything on Windows. There was a lot of uh, challenges in this uh, particular migration. Uh, one challenge was, for instance, that um, we were uh, unable to run the incremental during the day. So we have to, uh, to manage it during the night. So we can schedule that with our product. So, but uh, I think that this is one of the uh, of the thing that the customer asked us to do. The second thing, the customer wanted also to manage a cutover by shares, but there was a lot of shares actually. Then there was a particular uh, thing that was complex to manage with this customer. I think that maybe due to configuration, I do not have the exact detail. The customer was unable to do a, uh, to put their st source storage in read-only mode. So I uh, just had to advise the user that uh, the, the source storage are uh, on final sync and uh, please do not access to this, uh, this shares or this shares. But yeah, that was a little bit uh, one of the challenge. And in the same time, they wanted to restructure their, uh, their data. And uh, so the, they were merging some directories. They were, so there was a different source going to the, to the same target. So it was a kind of... A, uh, interesting challenge in terms of uh, consulting and professional services. And uh, so for this uh, particular use case, uh, we, of course, we plan and schedule cutover by shares. We use, uh, we heavily use the multi-threading capability of our solution and uh, parallel and balanced workload. Of course, uh, we move file while scanning. I think that as soon as we have a start to scan a storage, a source storage, we can start to move file as well. Uh, there was a lot of constraint on the bandwidth control. 
and uh, as usual, we preserve the ACL and the data integrity. Again, to Mark. I think that's really interesting to understand how we can do things in a more structured way rather than uh, you know traditional migrations of large amounts of data. We've we've seen we've seen bodies being thrown at it because it's considered to be you know the more cost effective way of doing it. But I think when you look at the length of time it takes to actually do. Um, a, a, I would call it a, ro a robust migration in a reasonable time, you suddenly realise that it takes a lot longer um, labour-wise to do it manually than it would do to use a, you know, a purpose-built tool like Myriad. And, and I also think that there's, there's unnecessary risk in doing it manually as well, because the one thing we all know is human error is the thing we talk about. We don't necessarily talk about um, automation errors so much. And I, and I think we're all fallible. We can always miss a, a, a share, a file, a particular directory off of a list that we're trying to migrate if we're doing it manually. Um, and some of these, some of the standard or I guess more uh, low cost or free tools to, to do these sorts of migrations don't have the advanced features you need to things like, you know, workload throttling and bandwidth um, scheduling and those sorts of things. So if you are a, a customer out there who's looking to to evaluate what they do next with their, their storage estate and you've got a migration problem to consider, then I'd highly recommend that you um, get in touch and drop us a mail and we can absolutely help you. And I think we've got Compellent SC, we've got VNX, we've got Ecologic, there are a bunch of other boxes that are end of life or going end of life, so VNX ones typically. A lot of those boxes are block or block and file, but of course in most instances that block data is actually connected to a file server and, and used as file storage anyhow. So no matter what the storage is, if it's connected to a Windows or a Unix server and presented as files, then we can make a, a really good case for a seamless low touch um, migration for you if you're interested. I think we are we moving on to questions now, um, Nick? Yeah, and there's actually one question uh, which is in that direction. I think one of the takeaways from this session is that um, you need a great solution to migrate data sometimes, and a Tempo can provide that solution, but you also need uh, people to, to help out on the ground. So one of the questions was more directly for CAE is if you offer on-site resident services for the migration process, or maybe with the lockdown, it's a bit more complicated. You're working uh, remotely. How, how does that work, uh, Mark? Maybe. I mean, we are we are still providing residence services. Um, it's it's it is a strange time. So we're providing um, remote residency services for those customers who don't want um, non-staff members on site, and we've got other customers who are accepting non-staff members on site. So we can be quite flexible, but. Um, we have I, I, we have something in the region of 70 residents um, that are in place around our customer sites doing all sorts of different tasks, but generally running their uh, IT for them or running projects for them. And likewise, you know, when it comes to migration projects, too. Yeah. So very happy to help with that. It's a it's a common request we get from our customers. And I guess it comes from them trusting us um, to run their IT for them and be their technology partner. Okay, absolutely. Maybe just as a follow-up question, Mark, on obviously you're a, a Dell Titanium partner, as you pointed out at the beginning. When we're migrating to new storages, to other Isilon storages, we'll talk about power scale maybe, uh, from, from different NASes, from other vendors, how, can that work and, and how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're, if you're a customer who has a significant NAS footprint, then uh, products like PowerScale or formerly sort of called Isilon with the 1FS file system are really, really interesting product products and technologies to make your life easy. And, you know, Christoph talked about multi-system to one migration. So if you're in a consolidation phase or looking to try and make it easier to manage, then things like PowerScale uh, absolutely fit the bill there. Okay, thanks very much. Maybe, Christoph, a question for you on the licensing behind Miria, how does it work? Is it capacity-based? Um, some of the use cases you mentioned there with uh, 100 or 400 terabytes of data, is it just based on the uh, on, on the target capacity? How does it work? The, the way it works today is the uh, we have a term license and uh, based on the volume that we will, uh, uh, we will migrate and, uh, and then the professional service side, of course. 
but yes, it's really based on the on the volume of my that uh, that should be migrated. Okay, and, and Miri, yourself, you, you touched on this as well, Christoph. It can also be used after the migration to continue synchronizing the different storages. It can also be used, obviously, as a as a backup tool, disaster recovery, uh, maybe even archiving. Well, yeah, I think that uh, that's a wider question. Sure. And, uh, so uh, what we have seen, I think that in example one that I shown before, that I've shown before. Uh, we, we started the migration and then there was the COVID happening and uh, for instance uh, we had to, to freeze everything so what we were doing during a certain period of time so nearly three months is uh, just keep in sync uh, the, the source on uh, target storages during a period of time. Uh, we recently also uh, work on a, on a project in uh, Netherlands actually where the customer was willing to, to keep also in sync during at least one year, if not two, uh, the source on target storages. So use, using the then the source storages as a kind of uh, uh, a kind of disaster recovery uh, storage, and uh, so that's something that we can uh, absolutely manage. And uh, we're happy to. I think that this is typically. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, we can do with uh, Miria for migration. And uh, on the top of that, might you need some, to do some backup as well? I think that we can leverage our uh, capability of fast scan, for instance, uh, to make sure that we are really efficient when uh, we are uh, considering a backup of uh, uh, a really large um, um, data set. I think that when we talk about a half a petabyte or multiple. Uh, petabyte uh, to, to be backed up, I think that the conventional solution uh, are not always um, efficient and you, you need a, a kind of new solution to do it. And a snapshot is great, but snapshot is not always, uh, it's not a backup. Is there any other question? I think that's okay. We've just about run out of time, uh, Christopher Mark, so maybe if you could just go to the slide at the end, uh, Christoph, which gives the contact details so we can see Russell King senior systems engineer who many of you uh, may know and have worked with already and, and Christoph yourself there with your email and, and phone number. So if you'd like to uh, contact our partner CAE or directly Christoph at the Tempo, please do feel free. And um, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Christoph. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thank you, Nick, as well. You're welcome. And uh, it's, I see it's 11 o'clock in Paris, 10 o'clock in London. So um, Good timing. <laughs> well, very well done. Thank you again and speak to you soon. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye bye.